Uh, we must now move to questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. Can I congratulate the Minister and welcome the Minister to her first uh, new question time. We will start with listed questions. I have to remind the House that questions 2 and 11 have been withdrawn. And I call Mr Roy Beggs. And can I too congratulate the Minister on her appointment at question number 1. Thank you very much to both the Principal Deputy Speaker and to um, uh, Mr Beggs for their congratulations. Uh, the Executive's Budget 2015-16 is predicated upon the implementation of welfare reform halfway through this year and the subsequent return of 50 per cent of the 114 million reduction applied by Her Majesty's Treasury. Delays in implementation will reduce the funding return to the Executive and while failure to progress the bill at all will mean the 114 million reduction will apply in full. Her Majesty's Treasury have not indicated the level of reductions beyond 2015-16. However, the Social Security Agency estimates of the foregone UK exchequer savings of not implementing welfare reform in Northern Ireland are significant and will increase in the coming years, reaching £366 million in 2018-19. Clearly, the removal of these sums will have significant impact on budgets and would necessitate further cuts at a time when we can least afford to reduce public spending. I call Mr Beggs for a supplementary. Uh, <coughs> the Minister has outlined that there are a range of other funds that are dependent on the uh, Stormont House Agreement being um, delivered. Can she uh, advise us just what are the options uh, in terms of presenting a balanced budget, which I understand has to occur before the summer recess, uh, if that funding if that agreement is not made, what are the options that exist for the Northern Ireland Executive? Well, of course, um, we did have a balanced budget when the Stormont House Agreement was made, and uh, of course there were a number of elements to that, uh, not least um, the implementation of the reduction of corporation tax, um, the ability to deal with uh, the money that was loaned to the Northern Ireland Executive, the £100 million. And, um, I have to say, at the moment, uh, given that the Stormont House Agreement has not uh, been implemented, there is, and I think my predecessor made this clear to the House at the um, last uh, question time, uh, there is a £500 million pounds hole uh, in the budget uh, at present. And there is a very short window of opportunity, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, to deal uh, with that matter. Uh, given that I'm only in post uh, less than 24 hours, that's something I've grasped pretty quickly. Uh, we have uh, around two weeks to deal with this matter, or we have to look to contingency planning in relation to the budget. And I certainly don't want to uh, go down that route, so we'll have to grasp this nettle very, very quickly. Well, Mr Oliver McMullen. And can I too congratulate the Minister on, on her appointment? But does the Minister understand that the majority of children in poverty live in, live in households where one or two parents are in work? In light of this, will the Minister ensure these families are less dependent on welfare by providing those in the public sector with a 1% increase on their basic wage? Well, of course, uh, what we want to prevent uh, is more people falling uh, into poverty. And certainly, if, if we can't uh, agree a budget uh, in this House before the summer recess, uh, then we will uh, be putting more people, more vulnerable people, uh, into poverty. And uh, I think that's something that everyone in this House would agree would be totally and entirely unacceptable. We must move ahead uh, with welfare reform. Uh, we must implement the Stormont House Agreement. Uh, it is there, it has been agreed, so let's get on with it and let's work to uh, make sure that Northern Ireland has a budget like every other part of these islands. Well, Ms. Palm Thank you, Mr. President. So, Speaker, can I also join the congratulations to the new Minister on her new role? I'm sure she'll do tremendously well. Um, just following on from her last answer, can she tell us is there an actual time limit um, by which um, welfare reform must be implemented? Well, I think I have uh, indicated that the next two weeks are, are absolutely crucial. Um, Her Majesty's Treasury have uh, removed £114 million, uh, from our Resource Dell budget this year to compensate for the uh, additional costs being incurred by the Exchequer as a consequence 
of welfare reform not being implemented um, in Northern Ireland. And, uh, this funding will be returned to the executive this year on a pro rata basis only following the implementation of, of welfare reform locally. So if we don't uh, agree welfare reform, uh, then we have to deal with that penalty and all of the other consequences which flow from the fact that we're not implementing the Stormont House Agreement. And there are many of those as well, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Mr. If uh, the punitive intransigence of our primary partner in government continues, how can she introduce a workable, viable budget number two bill in June? And if she can't, what happens? Well, if we get to that stage, and I very much hope that we don't get to that stage and that good sense uh, prevails, uh, as he will know, the legislation uh, allows for contingencies in such a case uh, as this. If we can't bring forward uh, the main estimates, if we can't move ahead with the budget bill, then there are contingencies in legislation. But I have to say, uh, those are pretty dogmatic, um, they're pretty nuclear, uh, and if we get to that stage, then we will uh, be in a very, very severe situation. And he knows the sort of contingencies I'm talking about. The most dramatic and most draconian of those, of course, is Section 59.1 uh, of the Northern Ireland Act, where uh, the Permanent Secretary in the Department of Finance and Personnel steps in. Um, and I very much hope that the House. Uh, recognises that that is not a place uh, where we want to be come the end of June. Well, Mr. Michael McJimsey. Uh, Deputy Speaker, can I too welcome uh, 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 Mrs. Foster to her new post? Question number three. Uh, of course, it is incumbent on each minister to ensure that their department and the arm's length bodies for which they are ultimately responsible have balanced their budget and are not at risk of overspend. Indeed, the public expenditure system works on the premise that they will do so. I will only know the actual position uh, for 2014-15 once the provisional outturn information which departments are due to provide me with later today has been analysed. I will report this to the Assembly in due course. However, I can say that from the latest forecast outturn information provided, uh, only one department, uh, the Department of Regional Development, is forecasting an overspend in its 2014-15 budget. Well, Mr. McGimsey, for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, uh, could I refer also to the, the, the danger of underspend? Uh, that departments actually underspend, and also the danger in this current financial climate that we may be forced to send money back to the Treasury. Can she give us some comfort and assurance on those points? Well, in relation um, to underspend, as I indicated, I am waiting the provisional outturn data from all departments, but if an underspend uh, of the degree reported in, in the press uh, materialises in respect uh, of the Department of Justice, um, uh, I will be expecting full and detailed information as to how uh, that occurred, um, because uh, if uh, a department reports an overspend, that is an issue, but also uh, it is very much an issue for us if there is a significant underspend, because as Mr McGimsey rightly points out, the last thing uh, we want to be doing is handing money back to Treasury at a time when we very much should be spending every single penny that we get. Well, Mr. George Robinson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister, can the Minister comment on the underspend reported within the PSNI budget? Can I congr congratulate her on her new appointment? I thank him very much for his uh, congratulations and indeed uh, all of the members who have taken the time uh, to congratulate me. Uh, some of them more than the know have taken the time to commiserate with me as well, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, so, uh, indeed, uh, the underspend uh, in the PSNI budget was the one I was referring to in respect of the Department of Justice, and I will want to understand how such, uh, if it is, as has been reported, obviously, I, I will wait. Uh, on, on the outturn coming to me, but um, I will want to understand and get behind how that kind of uh, mismanagement could occur uh, and what uh, caused it to occur. Are there 
uh, difficulties between the department and uh, the PSNI in, in terms of transparency, in terms of how they are dealing with each other. I will want to try and understand why that has occurred, if indeed it has occurred. Call Mr. Basil McRae. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I uh, offer the Minister my commiserations or congratulations, depending upon which is appropriate? Can I ask her, in relation to the Department of Culture, Arts and Leisure, which has a significant number of arm's length bodies, uh, many of the uh, bodies are telling us that they do not yet know how the voluntary exit scheme uh, will affect them or if it will be available to them, and this makes it very difficult to budget. Could you tell, uh, could you tell me, please, when such information will be available? Well, in terms of the general uh, voluntary exit scheme, and I presume that decals, decal, arms length bodies are included in that, but if they aren't, then obviously this won't apply. But in terms of the general scheme, and of course that's predicated on uh, welfare reform and having the money to be able to spend on the voluntary exit scheme, if, um, uh, if it is going ahead uh, and if we have the money, then I understand that uh, those who have applied in for the scheme will be receiving letters at the end of May, uh, beginning of June, to tell them whether they have been successful and, if they have been successful, what the terms are uh, uh, for them leaving uh, the civil service or, indeed, their arms length body. Call Mr. Patsy McGlown. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number four. It is uh, difficult to give the member uh, my assessment of the impact of the non-domestic revaluation precisely on the small business sector because, as the member will be aware, uh, businesses are classified as small or micro with reference to employee numbers, uh, those with 49 employees or less. Uh, there are almost 118,000 such businesses in Northern Ireland, but only 57,000 rateable commercial properties. However, what I can say is that many, if not the majority, of small business ratepayers have benefited from the revaluation. Uh, this is particularly the case in the retail sectors, though I readily admit uh, there are some uh, paying more. It all depends on the relative success or, or decline since the last valuation, as evidenced in open market rents. It is also worth pointing out that the Executive has continued to support business ratepayers despite a shrinking public purse. Uh, a package of support worth up to £30 million will see the impact of rates convergence effectively removed from any business ratepayer uh, through an 80 per cent subsidy this year, and over 33,450 businesses have received more than £62 million through the small business rate relief since 2010. And 375 new businesses have benefited from the introduction of em empty premises rate relief scheme from 2012. More than 5,500 businesses, and many of them are small businesses, have saved over £330 million in rates since the decision to continue uh, industrial derating was made. And all these rate relief schemes have been extended for 2015, 2016, uh, and likewise the regional rate set by the executive has been frozen in real terms. Mr. McGlone, first supplementary. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. President, Deputy Speaker. And uh, could I congratulate the Minister if congratulations is appropriate on her um, appointment to the, the Finance Ministry. I'm sure Daddy's loss will be finances gain. So the, um, in regard to the, um, the review of the non domestic rates on the small business sector, I am aware and has been quite public that some of the elevated rates have been very pronounced, including some as high as almost 300 per cent. So will the minister or her department, more importantly, be carrying out any analysis of how those have gone up so substantially in a number of cases, and indeed if, if there is a reason behind it or what support can be put in place for those people who have taken quite a substantial hike? Well, as I hope I, I outlined uh, in the main answer, we have put in place a, a range of supports uh, over this past uh, period of time. Uh, I think the fact that there has not been a revaluation re since 2001, uh, we are now seeing that revaluation re come in uh, based on 2013. Uh, rental values, and of course, there are many of people, there are many businesses and many individuals who will want to appeal. Uh, the rateable valuations that have been given to them, and uh, they are currently, I understand, in process. And I'm sure there will be many others that will uh, want to do that through the statutory process. 
I, of course, uh, will want to uh, look at the very extreme examples uh, at either end to see is there a reason why um, back in 2001 they were assessed at a particular level and then in 2013 they were assessed at a completely different uh, level and, and what has happened in between uh, to make that happen and if the member has any uh, specific examples I'm more than happy uh, to look at them but I have to say for those people dissatisfied uh, with uh, the new rate system for non-domestic rates they should appeal that's absolutely the first thing uh, they should do uh, to make sure that the appropriate level has been set but if there's any specific examples I'm more than happy to look at them. Mr. Adrian McQuillan. Thanks, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I also congratulate the Minister and agree with Mr. McGlone that the Eddie's loss will be finances game. Minister, you mentioned there in your last answer about uh, appealing. You know, could you tell us how people actually go about appealing these valuations? Well, they uh, need to uh, appeal through the appropriate statutory process. And uh, uh, whilst I know that some businesses will want to engage the services. Uh, of other valuers or of other uh, estate agents, uh, there is no necessity to do that because what uh, they should do is to point out that they don't believe that that uh, rateable valuation is fair and therefore they want it looked at again and it will be looked at again um, if uh, there's a disagreement at the end of that process then ultimately it can go uh, to the Lands Tribunal for a, a decision and I think uh, nobody likes paying rates, and I've heard my predecessor say that uh, on a number of occasions. But what we must ensure is that it's a fair uh, system. Uh, it's not a property tax, it is a tax uh, to allow us to reflect services uh, that people uh, are getting the benefit of, uh, and therefore we want it to be a fair one. Call Ms. Joanne Dobson. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I join in welcoming the Minister to her new role? Minister, you may be aware, but I have raised concerns and requested appeals on behalf of small businesses across my constituency with your predecessor. The extent of the rise has come as a sharp shock for too many small businesses. So, can I ask what further measures and actions you will take to ensure that sharp shock doesn't become for them a fatal blow? Well, I, as I said, I, I thank the member for her uh, comments. I, I do think it is important that if anyone is dissatisfied um, with any part uh, of the new assessment that they enter into the statutory process uh, as quickly as possible and not to leave it for more than a year because we don't want them uh, unable uh, to uh, gain any back pay if in, uh, indeed they are uh, successful. And, uh, so, first of all, have a look, see whether it's a fair estimate of what they could have rented their property for uh, back in the 1st of April 2013. If they don't believe that it uh, is a fair estimate, uh, then they need to appeal that uh, decision. And as I say, ultimately, uh, if uh, they can't come to a decision with LPS, it will go um, uh, to the Commissioner of Valuation and then to the Lands Tribunal. Call Ms. Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question five, Minister. Uh, a wide range of projects have been allocated FTC funding, including uh, the Agri-Food Loan Scheme, GP Practices, a range of housing schemes, uh, the University of Ulster Relocation Project, the Northern Ireland Science Park, the ARC 21 Project, uh, and a number of smaller schemes within DETI and Invest Northern Ireland. In addition to those schemes, uh, FTC funding has been set aside for the proposed Northern Ireland Investment Fund. This means that we have provisionally allocated all available FTC funding for 2015-16. Mm. Ms Kelly for supplementary. I thank the uh, Minister for her answer and congratulate her on her new posting and wish her every success in it. It is disappointing, nonetheless, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, that uh, all of the funding has been allocated for 15-16. So, Minister, what then is in the fund for any transactions coming forward in relation to infrastructure improvements? Well, the Northern Ireland Investment Fund uh, is there uh, for infrastructure projects. If they come forward, then that the money can be allocated from the Northern Ireland Investment Fund. I think it's actually very uh, good that all of the financial transaction capital has been allocated. Uh, because it means that we're not handing any of it back uh, to Treasury, but it has, it has been allocated uh, provisionally at this stage, and indeed if there are 
any uh, very good applications that come forward, then we can look at moving around that financial transactions capital, particularly in relation to the Northern Ireland Investment Fund. So happy to have a discussion if, if, if the member has anything in particular that she's thinking about. Call Mr. Ian McRae. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I too join the, the choir of, of congratulations to the Minister and to say that um, I enjoyed my time as her APS within DEDI. Um, can the Minister give some detail on how the private sector can engage with um, government to take, to take advantage of the financial transactions capital? Well, the financial transactions capital allocations require a sponsoring department, so there has to be a, a government uh, department involved uh, in any engagement. Uh, and should the private sector wish to engage uh, with government uh, on financial transactions capital, they should contact the relevant department or indeed uh, strategic investment board who will then engage uh, with the departments on the feasibility uh, of the project. Because as I indicated to Mrs Kelly, once the Northern Ireland Investment Fund is operational, uh, there will be a separate process for engagement on ac accessing its funding for strategic infrastructure or indeed any other type uh, of development. I think it is uh, a very good mechanism to try and channel funds into the private sector, uh, and I think it's going to work very well. Call Mr. Alex Easton. Um, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy uh, Speaker. Uh, question number six, and could I also congratulate the Minister on her new position? Thanks to the member and indeed to all the other members who have expressed um, congratulation. Um, in relation to question number six, there are positive signs of growth in the Northern Ireland construction sector, with an overall increase of 3.9% in output over the last three months of 2014. Housing output increased by 8.5% in that quarter and infrastructure by 3.6%. This is the highest level of growth reported for over two years and overall marks a 7% increase compared with the last quarter of 2013. The construction industry's turnover in the 12 months to the 31st of December 2014 was almost 2.2 billion, with over 53,000 people employed in the sector. Our local construction industry has demonstrated great versatility and resilience over the last eight years, with many firms winning major projects in Great Britain and beyond. Approximately 60% of the turnover of the top 20 locally based contractors was generated in Great Britain in quarter four of 2013. For the top five contractors, this figure was closer to 90%. The ability of local firms to compete and win work outside Northern Ireland is evidence of the quality of the local construction industry. That said, I much recognise the challenges the construction industry has faced uh, in recent years. The positive signs in these latest statistics are welcome, uh, but continued government investment in infrastructure and rises in public sector expenditure will clearly be important. I note the executive's capital budget for 2015-16 is $1.16 billion, and there are already a number of major construction projects underway. The Oma Hospital, Alton Gelvin Radiotherapy Unit and the Ulster Hospital Generic Ward Block are three such examples. Well, Mr Easton, for supplementary. Thank you. Um, could I ask the Minister what measures have been taken to ensure that the procurement pipeline for government infrastructure projects is available to the construction industry? Yes, I, I mean, I think this is a very important issue and it's one uh, that has been raised with me uh, in my former position uh, as Deputy Minister. It is very important uh, that the construction industry uh, have early visibility uh, of forthcoming uh, procurements uh, to allow them to get ready and indeed uh, to work together uh, with other companies so that they can make a, a good bid in terms of uh, the procurement. Uh, so Central Procurement Directorate have uh, published guidelines on the 16th of April uh, of this year mandating publication of information on the system by departments for their appropriate infrastructure projects. So I think that's a really good step forward. It will allow small companies and large companies to see what's coming down the line and then they can work together to bid in, uh, into the procurement and I think that that will be very, very helpful. Well, Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I too congratulate the Minister on her new position. Minister, um, and, and what extra can be done to support and stimulate this, the SME construction companies? And I, I appreciate you're only into the, into the job, but this is more of a suggestion than anything else. Given that VAT is zero on new builds, 
Would you consider a reduction in VAT to, say, 5 per cent on home improvement, say, under £15,000? That would unlock a lot of uh, capital. It would do a lot for the, for the construct, smallest construction industry. But in the long term, uh, the Exchequer would still get the same money back. Well, I only wish that the uh, executive did get the VAT receipts back, but of course we don't. Um, VAT is a reserved matter uh, and is dealt with by uh, Westminster. Uh, so therefore, uh, that is something that would have to be considered in that context. And uh, I'm sure it's something uh, that 14 MPs who actually go to Westminster will like to raise uh, with their colleagues over there. In terms of what more we can do uh, for uh, small businesses, particularly in the uh, procurement arena, uh, in my former job, the Intertrade Ireland project, um, Go to Tender, is a very powerful tool to allow companies to bid not only in this jurisdiction but also in the Republic of Ireland so that they can get involved in government procurement. And that has been really helpful, actually, uh, and it allows companies to network as well with each other so that they can see opportunities where they can work together uh, and make that successful bid. So I think that's something that you will see growing, uh, and I'm sure the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment will want to continue to support that programme in Intertrade Ireland because I think it's a very powerful one. I call Lord Morrow. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number seven, please. Uh, my department is leading the digital transformation programme which seeks to complete the delivery of 16 digital services by 2016 to achieve 3.5 million transactions by March 2016. The programme is on target to meet these milestones with seven digital services having gone live since March of 2014. As at the 31st of March 2015, just over 2 million transactions have been carried out online using these new digital services delivered through the transformation programme. The majority of transactions were made by citizens carrying out family history searches using the Genealogy NI service, with almost 1.7 million free searches and 236,000 paid searches completed. Call Lord Morrow for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her uh, detailed answer, and I too wish her well in her new department. Um, Minister, you undoubtedly are aware that there are those who do not have internet connection and access, and perhaps there are those who do not have those skills either. Uh, can you tell us what you propose to do or your department is doing uh, to address that issue? Uh, yes, indeed, and uh, he will know that we have been trying to deal with the lack uh, of uh, access to broadband through the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment, through the number of schemes available there. Uh, including uh, the broadband fund, which is working its way through the system at present and will be completed uh, by the end of this year. Uh, but as for um, getting more people uh, online, I understand that 80% uh, uh, of uh, the citizens of Northern Ireland are online and used to working uh, online, uh, but there's still that 20%, so he's right uh, to point that out. And the digital transformation service uh, within uh, DFP uh, includes a digital inclusion team who are working with partners across the public, private and third sector uh, to provide training uh, and support services to those in the community who can't currently access or use online channels and uh, where appropriate. Uh, services will include uh, an assisted digital provision and that uh, entails a, a trained NI Direct operator uh, completing the online transaction on the citizens' behalf to allow them uh, to use uh, the provision. So we are engaged uh, in work to help those who aren't currently online. Call Mr. Alex Maskey for a quick question. Again, in keeping with the rest of the member's sentiment, uh, could I wish the Minister best wishes in her new role. Uh, can the Minister outline uh, which public services actually could be met through digital delivery? Uh, well, the 16 by 16 digital transformation programme includes applying for a, a rate rebate, uh, applying for a driving licence, applying for free school meals and school transport, applying for fishing licences, registering a birth, death or marriage and online DARD CAP grants and subsidy applications and payments. Questions? Listed for topical question number three has withdrawn her name. I call Dr Alistair MacDonald.
Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could I first of all take this opportunity to congratulate the Minister on her promotion and express the hope that her personal generosity, for which she is widely known, will show itself in the Department of Finance? Could I, could I ask the Minister, in, in, in that spirit of goodwill, what, if she could give us at this stage, or if she has a chance to look at the voluntary exit scheme and uh, how it's progressing and where, where we're at with it, what the progress to date has made? Has there been uh, the application rate really I'm looking for? Well, I think uh, it's on record that there has been over 700, or 7,700 uh, people have applied for the voluntary exit scheme. Um, obviously, it's all predicated on us having um, the money available uh, to complete the voluntary exit scheme, and that's uh, uh, obviously uh, part of the Stormont House Agreement and indeed uh, dealing with welfare reform. But leaving all that aside, if all that's in place, uh, then it is hoped that letters will go out to those who have applied for the scheme by the end of this month, beginning of next month, to set out exactly uh, what it is uh, they can expect um, if they have been successful. And call Dr. Macdonald for a supplement. <laughs> Could I ask the Minister what sort of, obviously with 7,000, I think if I recall correctly, the target was somewhere in the region of 3,000. How, how will they be selected and can she assure us that uh, s large numbers of people in one department or one section of one department will not leave crippling that particular service? Well, I, I think the member has very much put his finger on the appropriate issue. Um, business needs of the particular department will be right at the top of the agenda in relation to selecting those for a voluntary exit scheme. Uh, we will want to ensure that business continuity continues in all of the departments and that the services to the public will continue uh, as much as possible uh, as they were. So that's very much part of what we're looking at when we're looking at the voluntary exit scheme. Call Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, given the recent good news in terms of foreign direct investment, it, it tends, I suppose, on the negative side, tends to uh, uh, increase the, the, the divide between rural and urban. What, what are you doing as Minister to um, redress that problem? Well, I, I, probably that's a, a question for uh, my successor uh, in Detty, but in terms of the good news from Invest Northern Ireland, I had the a very uh, happy experience of handing over at the Invest NI staff conference today uh, to uh, Mr Bell. And at that conference we were told that against a target of 25,000 new jobs in the programme for government, uh, we had achieved over 37,000 uh, new jobs for Northern Ireland. And when you look at the breakdown of assistance uh, to locally owned firms and external firms, uh, the majority of the money goes to locally owned firms. Uh, so actually some of our best known firms have been uh, working very hard to provide jobs for us here in Northern Ireland. Some of those most recently, of course, Randox up in Antrim, 540 jobs, Dunbea in Dungannon, the new firm Ishtech in uh, Lurgan. So there have been a very good geographical spread of jobs provided right across Northern Ireland. Well, Mr Rogers for supplement. Could I thank the Minister for that? Minister, in terms of public sector jobs, have you any thoughts of um, reallocating civil service jobs from out of the city into rural areas like into South Down? Well, some of those uh, experiences, particularly in the Re Republic of Ireland, have not been particularly positive. But of course, um, as you know, uh, there are some departments uh, who have been engaged in, in looking at this, uh, and indeed the Derby Minister hopes to relocate her headquarters. Uh, very, very soon to Bally Kelly. Uh, but of course, it's up to the particular individual minister to bring forward proposals in relation uh, to their headquarters, to their staff, to their agency headquarters, and then we will look at it against the business case. Well, Ms. Clare, so uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I will join everyone else in congratulating the minister on her new role. I hope she can bring the same amount of success to the Department of Finance and Personnel as she did to Detty. Um, like uh, Ms. Dobson earlier, um, I have requested a meeting with the minister's predecessor to discuss the revaluation process of non-domestic re uh, rates relief. And I hope the new minister won't be as reluctant to meet with me to discuss. Um, can the minister, or you know, will she provide me with um, a scoring mechanism? Um, on how we get 
to the, the net annual value of each property? Because currently it seems that we're applying a very qualitative process to a very quantitative outcome. I thank the member for her comments and as I indicated uh, to Mr McGlone, uh, it's a process that has been put in place where valuations are ba uh, based on uh, the rent payable uh, back in 2013 and if individuals or businesses feel that that is not a fair rent then of course they should uh, appeal and appeal the assessment and take it uh, further. Um, I won't be able to get involved in each of the appeals. Um, uh, I think at the moment there are over a thousand uh, such appeals uh, that have been registered. But I will be interested to hear generally about the either side of the scale to see well, what is it that has made that happen. And, and I'm very happy to look at those examples. Ms. Sugden for supplementary. Um, I suppose being mindful of the number of appeals that have been applied for and the number that have subsequently been upheld, um, is the Minister planning to review um, the, the rates uh, process of, of revaluation in uh, mindful of all of this? Well, I, I think she's probably aware that uh, my predecessor did put in place uh, a business uh, rates review. So he is actually looking at the whole process uh, of rates and whether it's something that needs to be looked at again. Is there a different way of uh, uh, gathering in that money, if it can be so crude, uh, to help us to deal with public services in Northern Ireland? Uh, and certainly I'll be taking that forward, that business review, to see what it is we can do different, if anything. Call Mr. Jonathan Craig. Thank you, Mr. Princ Deputy Principal Speaker. Um, can I also congratulate the Minister on her uh, promotion? And hopefully, she'll be equally as beneficial to some of my projects. <laughs> um, Minister, uh, can you give us an update on where we are with regard to the reduction of the rate of corporation tax in Northern Ireland? I thank the member uh, for his comments, and I was happy to help him with that uh, broadband at Anna Hilt, uh, which was a, a huge issue for him um, and indeed his constituents. In relation to corporation tax, royal assent has been given uh, to the devolution of corporation tax bill, uh, so it is now uh, in place. But of course, uh, the devolution is contingent on the Stormont House Agreement being implemented in full, and therefore, uh, I'm back to the same issue again about the implementation of welfare reform and the full implementation of the Stormont House Agreement. And I have to say, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, the business community, uh, which I have worked alongside for seven years, will not forgive this assembly or this executive if we do not achieve the devolution of corporation tax after a very, very long campaign to bring it here to Northern Ireland and to make a difference uh, for not just uh, businesses in Northern Ireland, but for the growth of the economy in Northern Ireland. So therefore, we must grasp that nettle and we must deal with it in the short window that's available to us. Mr Craig for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, and thank you for that. Um, will you be having further uh, talks with the new government in Westminster over this issue and maybe how we get around th this impasse that we have at present? Well, of course, I'd be happy uh, to speak with uh, new colleagues uh, in the Treasury. I look forward uh, to working with the new Chief Secretary to the Treasury, uh, who will be my principal contact uh, in Westminster. Uh, and indeed uh, with other colleagues, but the, let's be under no illusion, uh, the impasse is here uh, in Belfast uh, in the Assembly uh, and we need to deal with it and we need to deal with it very quickly. Ms. Bronwyn McGoggin is not in her place. I call Mr Chris Hazard. Uh, uh, I want to ask the, the Minister just in light of, for a new role. Um, what, what request she will be making of the, the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer in Britain to meet as soon as possible to discuss uh, the very bleak economic outlook that looks to be heading our way as a result of the Tories? Well, I will be meeting uh, with the new Chancellor of the Exchequer, who is the same as the old Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, for the United Kingdom. Uh, we will obviously want to talk to him uh, about the settlement for Northern Ireland moving forward, and I very much look forward to that engagement. Call Mr. Hazard for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for answer? Can I ask the Minister just for analysis uh, of the touted £30 billion, uh, in cuts heading this way? Uh, um, for this jurisdiction and what impact that will have on our public services. 
Well, can I say uh, to the member that the cuts uh, that are heading uh, this way, as he puts it, from um, the Conservative government will be nothing compared to the fact that uh, if we don't agree welfare reform, we don't have a budget, and then we have to come to the legislative contingencies which will cover us because I don't think the public of Northern Ireland will forgive us if we can't deal with budgetary issues and with welfare reform issues because it's not just, and we hear many times Sinn Féin talk about the vulnerable in our society, everybody will be vulnerable, every single person in this country will suffer if we cannot agree a budget. Call Mr. Danny Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and may I congratulate the Minister too. Um, we've touched on financial transactions capital, but I would just wonder did all departments apply for it, if that's the right term, and has it, will it all be definitely spent, or is there still a, a little bit of leeway? Well, I, I can't speak for other colleagues, and I certainly won't give a guarantee that it will all uh, be spent. But uh, there have been a number of departments, principally those with large infrastructure uh, issues, who have applied. Um, uh, my own uh, former department, uh, in particular, had some large energy projects which we applied in for, and uh, very much hope that those will be able to avail of financial transactions capital, because that will really assist uh, in moving some of those issues in relation to energy forward. Well, Mr. Kethan, for supplementary. Thank you. D does that mean, Minister, that? none will be handed back, i.e. there are enough people queuing up to use it so that none will ever get given back to the Treasury? Well, I, again, I can't answer for other colleagues, but there will be um, a certain level of flexibility through uh, the budget exchange at the end of the year, but at the moment, uh, provisionally, all of the financial transactions capital has been allocated, uh, so I am hopeful that we will be able to deal with this very useful tool in terms of engaging with the private sector uh, in Northern Ireland and allowing them to have access uh, to financial help. Mr. Fra McCann is not in his place. Mr. Nelson McCausland is not in his place. As the next period of questions does not begin until 3.30, I suggest that the House takes its ease until then.